Michelle Kennedy and welcome to Learning Curve, the VHub series brought to you by Vodafone Business. In this episode, I'm speaking to Graham Cluley about cyber security. Graham has been working in the computer security industry since the early 1990s. He's seen everything in the world of cybersecurity, from the first antivirus software to the evolution of ransomware, phishing, and modern cybercrime. Graham is a leading commentator and is now the host of his own podcast, Smashing Security. Graham, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming in today. Oh, thank you. It's lovely to be here. I'm really excited. <laughs> and this is absolutely a learning curve for me today. Um, I'm loosely calling this Sleeping Tigers for reasons that will become obvious okay. shortly. Um, I'd love to just hear a little bit about your expertise and how you came from um, building computer games in the 90s <laughs> to being a security expert. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So, I'm Graham Cluley, and 30-odd um, years ago, um, I was writing computer games as a student, impoverished student, didn't have any money. And at the end of my games, which were given away for free, it posted a message on your screen saying, I'm a poor, impoverished student. If you enjoyed my game, send me £5 or £10 through the post because then I'll be able to afford to go to the supermarket and visit my girlfriend who's studying in Paris. And uh, amazingly, people did. People liked my games. One day, I got home, big parcel on the doorstep, opened it up. There was a cheque for £20, which is more than I asked for, and a copy of Dr. Solomon's Antivirus Toolkit. And Alan Solomon was the UK's leading antivirus expert, one of the experts around the world. And in his letter, he said, if you want a job, let me know. Give me a ring. And I became a computer programmer writing antivirus software. And here I am 30 odd years later, um, still talking about computer security issues and how people can protect themselves. Tell me more about what's changed um, and how sophisticated or not things have become in terms of risk um, since, since you started. It's completely changed. Yeah. It's crazy. In the beginning, it was kids in their back bedroom. It was electronic graffiti is what was happening. It wasn't done with financial motive. People were writing viruses and uh, spreading malware, as it became to be called, um, really to show off to other people. <laughs> Over time, money became involved. And it moved from being 200 new computer viruses every month to where we are today, where there's like over a million pieces of new malware every 24 hours. Wow. So in the blink of an eye, <laughs> an, an eye blink just takes like, I don't know, 0.3 of a second or something like that, there will have been a new piece of malware created, which has been posted up on the web and potentially going to infect someone. So what happened was money became involved and computer criminals realized they could make an awful lot of money rather than just spreading graffiti. And we'll talk today about some of the ways in which they managed yeah. to do that. But it's it's become a huge business for them and as such a menace for every other company in the world. And what are the biggest threats from this menace? Because, And I think that's the most important point mm. for every company in the world, whether you are starting up five people, 5,000 people, 500,000 people, yeah. it's a risk for all of us. What are those yeah. biggest risks? So there's a couple of things which are really, really hot at the moment. Um one of them I'm sure people will have heard of is ransomware. Yeah. And this is where a piece of malicious code, a virus if you like, or a piece of malware will enter your network or enter your computer and it will encrypt all of your data files, your Word documents, your spreadsheets, your images. Maybe your, on a personal level, it could be your family photos, things which are precious to you either as a business or as an individual. And it locks it up with a key which you do not have. And you then have a ransom note appear on the screen saying, unless you pay us however much money via cryptocurrency, which is untraceable, you will not be able to unlock your files. You will not have access to your files anymore. Now, the response many businesses had to that was, well, we're all right because we've got backups. So if our data is encrypted, we can restore from a backup and recover. And what the criminals did then was they said, OK, so maybe you've got backups. Doesn't matter. We've taken a copy of all of your files before we encrypted it. And we are going to publish it on the dark web. So if you don't pay up however many Bitcoin or Monero that we're asking for, 
all of your data is going to be available for anyone to exploit or we'll sell it to other hackers. And they proactively advertise the fact on their websites that you have been hacked. And it's a very big problem on the internet right now. And I suppose that applies to whatever size of company you are. They're just going for the root of wherever the value is. Yeah. I mean, they don't care whether you're a small business or a yeah. multinational. I mean, yeah. the thing for them is often a multinational might be, it might have more money to pay out, but it's also probably going to be a bit harder to get in. Probably a larger company will have a dedicated security team. They may have measures in place. If you're a small company and you're suddenly being asked for £400,000, that could be the end of your company. Yeah. You may not be able to afford that. Yeah. What's zero trust? So zero trust is a different way to approach in computer security. Um, and you can think of it in a way uh, a bit like a, a fortress or a prison. So with a traditional prison, you might have one ruddy great big wall around the outside, which which works fine as long as the check worked on the door, you know, right. not to let only the right people out and only the right people in. You know, then it works. With zero trust, you are constantly assessing whether someone should have access to a particular place or not. So you're constantly seeing, is this person who's requesting this data, are they authorised to access it? They may have logged in earlier, mm. but do we still trust them? Is their computer patched? Are they running the latest security uh, fixes on, those, on that device? Are they configured properly? So it's constantly doing that. Now, the the challenge with zero trust is to make sure that you're doing those security checks all the time without cramping your ability to do business. Right. So the best zero trust security is not going to get in the way of you doing your business. It's only going to matter when there's someone in there who shouldn't have access because they're not secure enough. And why, therefore, is it important for, for training our teams? Like, Why do we have to train our teams around zero trust? I think I think with anything security wise, it's good to get people on board. Yeah. Good to have people so they're not trying to subvert or go round the security which you have in place. Because there is that temptation, you know, people get frustrated, like, oh, crumbs, you know, it's stopping me from accessing this. Well, it's stopping you from if it's been configured properly, it's stopping you from accessing it for a very good reason. Right. So you have to get everyone in your company on board that they are part of the security team. They're actually playing their part. Ultimately, they're going to decide whether they click on that link in an email or open that email attachment. You can yeah. have all these security uh, layers in place and they do a great job. But ultimately, there's a human there who's deciding whether to click or not, whether to enter their password or not. When we're thinking about that kind of training and, and that kind of individual within a business and you know that power that you have at that moment or it, it, to make the right decision or the wrong decision... What are typically some of the biggest mistakes that we're making as individuals in organisations or as business leaders? What are the most common mistakes that we're making in terms of protecting our business from cyber security? In, in terms of training hackers? people? Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to be all in it together. <laughs> you, yeah. you want to all be singing from the same song sheet. And so you want people to realise that you're not putting security in place to prevent them from doing their job. Yeah. You want security actually to enable them to do their job more st- you know, more safely, more securely, and to actually, you know, be less of a hindrance in future. So you have to get them on board as to why you are doing these things and you're not just making rules for the sake of it. And giving people, when people, for instance, say, oh, but I really want to use this particular website or this particular tool, giving them a route by which they can go to the IT team and say, look, here's my case. This is why I want to use this. I know you haven't looked at it before. Could you take a look at it? Because it would really help me. So you need assistance from both sides to talk to each other, be open and transparent about what you're doing, rather than just trying to block people all the time. Because ultimately, your company is trying to make business, trying, right. to, trying to do its, its job properly. There can be a problem when you are doing security training that people can begin to feel like like they're somehow a bit dumb or whatever. Yeah. Oh, that's obvious. And Obviously, yeah, I right. wouldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things which happens is... Um, some companies do phishing tests where they will bring in an outside company to test the employees to see if they're likely to click on links which pretend to come from the IT team or go to a dodgy website. And some people don't like that. Some people feel like, oh, you're making a fool of me. Yep. Or you're trying to trick me and they resent it. Yep. So you have to quite carefully handle that message. 
and make sure that you're not kind of going, nah, nah, nah. you know, you, you fell for it. You know, don't do, don't make fun of people. You're there really to help people. Everyone can make a mistake. What you're trying to do is make it happen less frequently. So get them on board, help them to realise the impact of what a security incident can actually mean. For me, I think that is the most critical message that I've received loud and clear from our conversation before this as well, which is this is not just about, um, you know, this is a good to have or a nice to have. This is really about protecting your business from not being here tomorrow because the consequence either financially or reputationally or both is so severe you know, you spoke about ransomware. What are the other things that we should be aware of? The other thing which is going on, which gets talked about less often, is something called business email compromise. And this is where the hacker breaks into your email system, maybe via a phishing attack, for instance, maybe by tricking an employee to enter their password somewhere where they shouldn't have done. And once they've got access to your email, they see the communications inside your company. And they may see you dealing with an external supplier or a contractor. Maybe you've got someone who is building... Imagine, I don't know, imagine you're a university, for instance, and you've got a a new bit of the campus being built, and it's going to cost £5 million. Yep. And that's a big operation. That's a big project. It may go on for 18 months or so. The hackers are seeing all the emails which are going on about that project. They know it's happening. They know who your suppliers are. They know who you've contracted to build this building. And they see when the contractor is approaching the milestone, which means at that point, the hackers who've created a bank account in the name of your supplier can send an invoice which looks completely legitimate to your finance department saying, we're waiting for the payment for this. Can you please pay us the one million or five million or whatever it may be? And your finance department contacts you, who's project managing this project, and says, is it true? Have they have they completed everything? And you say, yep, yep, they've done it. I can see the building. It's all been done. We're ready to pay for it. And the finance department make the payment. Sleeping tigers, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> because it's not just so instant, right? They're not just breaking in and going for it. Right. This is something that is strategically planned meticulously over time to really bring you into their story. Graham, you're making me think about password security. <laughs> How do we get a good password? Right. Well, the first rule of passwords is stop using your human brain <laughs> because you are... Password123 t- is not uh, the oh, thing. La, 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 la. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. I've heard them all. Trust me. I've heard them all. Um, <laughs> yeah. Don't... I'm afraid we aren't genetically very good at creating passwords. Yeah. Even if you think, oh, my password has to be good, you know, I need to have a a non-alphanumeric in there, so I'll add an exclamation mark at the end. Who'd have thunk it? Who'd who'd have guessed (laughs) that one? You know, exactly. The the hackers know all these tricks. Even if you have the favourite name of your football team and then uh, something else. So there's one problem, which is that you've got a password which is too easy to crack. Yeah. And the hackers can use computers to very, very rapidly crack passwords. So they will either use a dictionary, a vast dictionary. They have dictionaries of past password hacks of past databases, which they can just throw at your account if they want to. But they also can sort of do a brute force attack as well. So you need a long password. It needs to be gobbledygook. It needs to have numbers and exclamation marks and at signs and all the all the characters. I don't want to name the characters because I want you to use something else instead. Yes. Right? All those all those bits of the keyboard you never ever press. You want some of those in it and it needs to be long. The problem then is how are you going to remember the password? Because of course you can't remember a password like that. And you would never write it down. You on a post-it note. <laughs> and stick it underneath your monitor. That would or, be terrible. Or type it into a text file and store it on your hard drive. Who would do that? Or, or, so you need you need to have a password manager which can securely store your password in a vault. Yeah. Um, and you have one master password which unlocks that vault and automatically enters the password for you. But there's another problem with passwords, right? It's not just generating complicated passwords. I would argue it's even more important to have unique passwords, which means you need to have a different password for every account you use. I wouldn't be able to tell you my Twitter password or my email password or my eBay password because they're all 20 plus characters long and all gibberish. 
And all of those are being stored by my password manager. The reason why you need to have unique, different passwords for every account is the first thing that hackers do. When they hack into a service and they steal all of the passwords, the first thing they do is they will take those passwords and see if it will unlock your email address as well. Okay, we know his password for this site. Will it also unlock his email? And so many people are using the same password. And then they're into your life. The Your email is the centre of... That's your life. Yeah, well, it is. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's the fulcrum f- from which all of those other accounts are connected. So if they want to get into, I don't know, your PayPal account or something. Yep. You, they, they are, you, you go to PayPal and you ask for a password reset and it will send the email to your email account. So PayPal hasn't done anything wrong at Absolutely. all. Absolutely. It's just done what you, you asked it to do. But the hacker now has a way of resetting your password on PayPal or many of the hundreds and hundreds of other websites which are out there. So you've got to protect your email with a unique password. And if I'm going to give you an extra level of nerdiness, an extra level of protection. Yes, we need it. We want it. <laughs> then you have to have two-factor authentication. Yes. Or, or sometimes called multi-factor authentication. So people will be familiar with this from their bank account, like most likely. So when you make a payment to an account you've never paid before, your bank makes you jump through a few hoops just to confirm who you are. Like, why are you doing this? You know, what are you doing this for? And often it will send a code to your phone. Yep. And... You have to enter that code. And that way, the bank knows you. it's not just someone who's accessed the account via a website. They've also got your phone. So you can turn on that kind of level of additional protection, not just for your bank, but for your email, for your Twitter, for your Facebook, for your social media, for all so many sites. And I would strongly recommend that because that means if your password is phished, the hackers won't know that two-factor code, and so they, which changes every 30 seconds or so. So it's a much higher level of protection. Whilst we're on the subject of protection, when we were just chatting before, we were speaking about kind of, I I always want to know, like, who do you use for your email provider? What are you doing? Um, How do I be more like Graham? Um, But but (laughs) from a business perspective, at what point should we start thinking about paying for the services and using business uh, specific services as opposed to thinking about consumer freebie off the shelf. You know, yeah. it's okay because this email, I'm gonna, I'm only going to use it for a year anyway and, you know, then, then I'll work it out. Well, it can be true that free services are secure yep. and do a good job in terms of privacy and security. That, that definitely can be true. Personally, I like to pay for things because if I pay for an online service, then I think they care about me. Yeah. And it means that if I call someone up and ask for support, they're going to be able to support me. And if I'm using something like email, for instance, or websites and web hosting and things yeah. like that, which are important to my business, I would like someone to phone up or someone to contact if it goes wrong. Yep. Because it's going to affect my bottom line. And people have no businesses have no qualms about buying printers or paper, or post-its, and other things. So why wouldn't you pay for a password manager, for an email service, for antivirus software, or a VPN, and other things like this? And it's an element of control, isn't it? You make the decision about where you take that business and who you kind of share all of those, those things with. Let's talk about the cloud. Mm. Um, you described the cloud as it's just someone else's computer. Yeah. Can you tell me how we should think about the cloud in terms of small business owners and, and what we should be thinking about? So the reason why I say cloud is just someone else's computer is that years ago, people were describing it as this magical thing. It's like, oh, the cloud is going to solve cloud. all of our problems. Yeah. It's like, well, hang on, what, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? And it's like people thought, well, that has to be safe then because it's all the way up there out of the reach of hackers. And it's like, no, it's just someone else's computer. And you don't necessarily know how well they've protected it. Yeah. Um, now, obviously, there are major cloud services out there who do a fantastic job with security. And I think the cloud can be a really good solution, particularly for small businesses, because you don't necessarily have the internal resources right. to create the servers and the databases and the infrastructure in-house. Um, you're going to constantly be patching things and you need security expertise. So I think it 
it can make a lot of sense to use third-party services. Obviously, choose them carefully. Make sure you're paying for them and they, they, they want you as a customer right. and they're doing a good job. What's important is how you configure sometimes those cloud services. So sometimes people have left what are called buckets, buckets of data on the cloud. I, I don't know where the word bucket comes from. Maybe it's from rain or something. But they've left them wide open to the outside world so anyone can go in and access the database. That has been a problem and it's been a source of a lot of data breaches. So yeah. make sure it's configured properly and locked down if you're yeah. going to use the cloud. I think that there can be a tendency to think I'm not a technical person. Mm. Uh, I All I want to do is run my business. This, yeah. this feels like someone else's problem. Yeah. What are the key step, practical steps I can take from a security perspective to prevent phishing or to prevent cyber threats, what should I be doing? So there's a whole raft of different tools and things which you can use um, and technologies. And we've mentioned one already, the password manager, which is a great addition. I'd recommend that for any business whatsoever. Obviously, you need up-to-date antivirus software because I've described how often new malware is coming out. It has to be constantly being updated automatically in the background. Um, you also need to think about encrypting your data as well. So if your staff are going out and about with their laptops, you need to make sure that if they lose their laptop, hackers won't be able to somehow extract sensitive data from that laptop right. and make use of it. So you need encryption in place there. Basically, encryption should be the default. You should have to put together a really strong argument for data not to be encrypted. What's the business case for this not to be encrypted rather than the other way around? So make encryption the default, makes life harder for the hackers, have password policies, and train your staff, raise awareness, make them part of the culture of security in your business so that they genuinely care and they don't think that it's an obstacle to doing work, that they actually think this is the thing, meaning that I'm going to get a check at the end of the month because yeah. the company's still going to be here. We're protected. Yeah. And and particularly for small businesses, I think often we are not doing everything in-house. We often mm. work with contractors, yeah. with third parties. How far are we within our rights to question a third party or a contractor's security? Absolutely. I think, I think you should be asking yeah. those people because especially if you're giving them access to your data. Yeah. If you're giving them, for instance, if you've got a newsletter list of people you want to email, are the people who are providing you with that newsletter service doing the right thing security-wise to make sure that that database doesn't end up in the hands of hackers? Right. Because the headline will be that you've lost people's details. Even though it was a third party technically who got hacked, it will come out as being your problem. And it is your problem. It's your reputation. Um, and there will be other suppliers and contractors who may log into your network. You want to make sure that they, at the very least, are doing the same kind of things that you are doing security-wise. You don't want them to be the weak link. And so regular risk assessments? Regular risk assessments, absolutely important. And yeah. you can do things like penetration testing. You can, uh, you can bring in third parties basically to hack your company before the malicious hackers do. And so they will come in and they will find the vulnerabilities and security holes and then give you a report and say, these are the things you need to fix. That's been quite transformatory for us as well yeah. and, and very eye-opening, yeah. uh, even, even at places where you, you feel pretty robust. So on the thought process of having a security mindset, mm. and, and certainly from within my own business, we invested a lot of time and resource last year in really getting into that mindset of, are we running, th treating kind of security as we treat product, as we treat uh, finance, as we treat IP, really giving it its own uh, kind of heading and, and agenda. And from that perspective, I think it's quite transformed our business and how mm. we think about it. Graham, we've talked a lot about cybersecurity and we've talked a lot about phishing and hacking and malware. Are we all doomed? I do worry sometimes that if, if you invite me to a party, I'm going to be terribly depressing <laughs> by, by spreading all these horror stories of, you know, cyber scare stories. Um, no, we're not doomed. Um, Although the security problem is serious, if you take the right steps, you can protect yourself better. You know, the internet, yeah, of course there's horrible stuff on the internet, but the internet's amazing. Yeah. The internet's brilliant. Yeah. It's not only connected lots of people, it's created fabulous communities. Yeah. Um, and there's so much good which is out there as well. So 
I'd say, don't shut the door and think we're all doomed. and <laughs> Don't do that. Instead, what you need to do is protect yourself because by following just a simple few steps, you can dramatically improve the security of your company and make it harder for the hackers to gain access. Three things I'm going to do back in the business. I've yep. just listened or watched this um, and I'm going back into my business. What do I need to do? Okay, I'll give you three things in no particular order. Number one, I want you to get a password manager. I want you to stop reusing the same passwords in different places. I want all of your staff to have different passwords for everything. Say, you're going to have a password manager which will remember them for you and store them securely. Okay, so that's really great advice. Life-changing, yeah. life-changing. <laughs> Number two, you are going to turn on two-factor authentication. So it's an additional level of security. So if you do get fished, the hackers will find it much, much more difficult to gain access to your accounts because they won't know that six-digit code which is generated by an authentication app on your user's smartphone. So that will better protect you as well. And you'll ensure that all of those systems are in place when your users log in remotely. So if you let your users log in remotely to their email or to the network, make sure that you are checking for all of those things as well before they gain access. And the third one, the third one's really to do with the culture, which I think is important. We've spoken a lot about technology, yeah. but you need to get your staff on board as well. So train them, teach them about security, make it fun, make it engaging, make it interesting. And if you can't do that, bring someone else in who can do a good job of doing that. And Get them on board, help them to understand why it's so important. And they will appreciate it because computer security doesn't just matter in the office. It also matters at home. Yeah. And everyone's got a computer in their pocket and everyone's going online all the time. So they will benefit from greater awareness of cybersecurity issues. I love it. Security by design. This is not just something that we do as an afterthought. Just bake it in from the start. You should do. Graham, thank you so much for coming in today. I feel very much wiser um, and very much clearer on my security mindset. So uh, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Learning Curve, the V-Hub series presented by me, Michelle Kennedy, and brought to you by Vodafone Business. If you are starting or building an SME business, do check out the free V-Hub service from Vodafone. VHub offers access to webinars and training on digital topics. You can also speak to a team of advisors for guidance specific to your business. Support can really help to fast track your plans. So do use the free resource and speak to an advisor today. For more information, search Vodafone VHub or click on the link provided.